tremendous support. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. I think I'm doing very well, but we're going to make sure that things work out. The First Lady is doing very well. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will never forget it. Thank you. President Trump leaving isolation at the White House for Walter Reed Medical Center after testing positive for COVID-19 out of, quote, an abundance of caution. COVID in the White House. President Trump and the First Lady in the aftermath of their diagnoses. We have new reporting on the president's course of treatment and the contact tracing efforts now underway. Could the crowded ceremony at the Rose Garden for Amy Coney Barrett have been a super spreader event? At least four people, including the president and first lady, have now tested positive after attending it. The presidential race now seemingly frozen in time. Joe Biden on the trail tonight. He and his wife testing negative, but as voters cast their votes, is the campaigning effectively over? Concerns tonight about President Trump's age and overall health putting him at greater risk of the virus. The major constitutional question, what happens if the president is unable to do his job? Right now, he remains in control. Questions over exposure at the debate. We'll talk with someone who was there, sitting 15 feet away from the president, the guest of Joe Biden, who lost her father to COVID earlier this year. We also speak to the president's former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski. And we are tracking major developments in the deadly police shooting of Breonna Taylor. Grand jury recordings now made public. Our nation pressed on all sides tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. An October surprise like no other. The President of the United States and the First Lady have now joined the more than 7 million Americans who have been infected with coronavirus. As a precautionary measure, the President has received an experimental antibody cocktail, and out of an abundance of caution, the President is now being treated at Walter Reed Medical Center, where he's expected to stay for several days of testing. We watched as the President's helicopter, Marine One, flew over Washington, making its way to the hospital. All this a reminder of just how quickly things can escalate. Just last Saturday, the president introduced his nominee for the Supreme Court, Amy Coney Barrett. At least four people at that event have now tested positive. Earlier this week, he held a rally in Minnesota. And of course, we all saw him at that now infamous debate going head to head against former Vice President Joe Biden, who has now tested negative. Yet another dizzying and consequential news day of 2020. We are now facing the most serious health crisis involving a U.S. president since President Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981. Our chief White House correspondent Jonathan Carl leads us off with how we got here and what we know now. A sign of just how serious the president's condition is. He was taken via helicopter late this afternoon to the Walter Reed Medical Center. Multiple sources close to the president say he is experiencing the signature symptoms of COVID-19. Fever, chills, nasal congestion, and a cough. The White House released a statement from the president's doctor saying he has been treated with a, quote, polyclonal antibody cocktail, as well as zinc, vitamin D, famitotidine, melatonin, and a daily aspirin. As of this afternoon, the doctor wrote, the president remains fatigued but in good spirits. He's being evaluated by a team of experts, and together we'll be making recommendations to the president and first lady in regard to the next steps. Earlier, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows provided few details on the president's condition. The president does have mild symptoms. He continues to be not only in good spirits, but very energetic. Remarkably, Meadows, who has been in close contact with the president, addressed reporters without a mask. So did Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany, who refused to elaborate on the president's health or how he was tested. I'm not going to get into um, the president's symptoms exactly. I'm not going to get in exactly what type of test. The president himself has gone silent. The last word from him, a tweet shortly before 1 a.m., where he announced that he and the first lady had tested positive. His public schedule included a phone call today to discuss protecting seniors from coronavirus, but Vice President Pence handled the call instead. Last night, President Trump told Sean Hannity he was waiting on test results after learning one of his very closest aides, Hope Hicks, had tested positive. He implied Hicks had been infected by a member of the military or law enforcement. You know Hope very well. She's fantastic and she's done a great job. But it's very, very hard uh, when you are with people from the military or for law enforcement and they come over to you and they they want to hug you and they want to kiss you because we really have done a good job for them and you get close and things happen i was surprised to hear with hope but she's a very warm person with them and she she knows there's a risk 
Hicks had been at the president's side all week. Tuesday, she was at the debate in Cleveland, where members of the president's family sat in the front row without masks. Wednesday, she traveled to his rally in Duluth, Minnesota. You see her here walking to Marine One without a mask, Jared Kushner right behind her. She touches the handrail, and then so does he. At the rally, President Trump tossed hats to his supporters. And sources tell ABC News Hicks was starting to experience symptoms. On the ride home, she was quarantined on Air Force One. ABC's Jordan Phelps was on that flight and saw Hicks exit through the back. It was striking because at the time she was wearing a mask. It was striking because Hope Hicks never wears a mask. Sources tell us Hicks tested positive yesterday morning. The White House won't say when the president found out. Meadows told reporters his team sprang into action just as Trump was heading out to a fundraiser in New Jersey. In terms of Hope, Hope Hicks, uh, we uh, discovered that uh, right as Marine One was taking off yesterday, we actually pull, pulled some of the people that had been traveling and in close contact. But they didn't pull the president off the chopper. He went on to meet with about 100 supporters at his Bedminster Resort, even though he knew he'd been in close contact with Hicks. The governor of New Jersey is now urging anyone who was there well to take the precautions. We urge everyone who was in and around the Bed Bedminster event or events yesterday to take full precautions, including self-quarantining and ultimately getting tested. Hours after the fundraiser, the president appeared via a pre-recorded video at New York's traditional Al Smith dinner and declared the COVID crisis all but over. I just want to say that the end of the pandemic is in sight. Then just six hours later, he tweeted out his own test results. The first lady and I tested positive for COVID-19. We will begin our quarantine and recovery process immediately. We will get through this together. This morning, the first lady tweeted she was experiencing mild symptoms. The White House doctor said Mrs. Trump has a mild cough and headache. Now the White House is scrambling to track down everyone who's been in contact with the president, the first lady and Hope Hicks. It's not an easy task. Over the past several days, the president has held one large scale event after another with no social distancing and very few people wearing masks. On Saturday, hundreds of supporters jammed into the Rose Garden as he announced his Supreme Court nominee. Utah Senator Mike Lee was there, caught on camera hugging one person after another. Today, Senator Lee announced he had tested positive. Also in the crowd, the president of Notre Dame, Father John Jenkins. He wasn't wearing a mask either, and today he tested positive for COVID too. Tuesday, the president and his entourage traveled to Cleveland for the debate, where he mocked Joe Biden for wearing masks. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Wednesday, as he headed out to his rally, he shouted answers to reporters' questions. But the president cut that rally short, and sources tell ABC that top aides noticed he appeared exhausted and fatigued. Some figured he was just tired. Others worried he may have been exposed to COVID-19. Still dancing, though, in that picture. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Walter Reed Medical Center, where the president is now being monitored. What's the latest on the president's condition, and what's the plan for his stay there at Walter Reed? Well, there's not much in the way of detail about the president con president's condition. Uh, we know that he has some of those classic symptoms of COVID-19, uh, that he has chills, a fever, uh, nasal congestion, a cough. Uh, we're told that he will be here for a few days. The White House press secretary uh, says he will be working out of what she calls the presidential offices here at the Walter Reed Medical Center for a few days. Uh, obviously, Lindsay, he wouldn't be here if he didn't need to have access uh, to some of the best medical care in the world. Right, because we'd imagine also that there would be some of that kind of equipment inside the White House. And John, you've also been Absolutely. reporting on, on the massive contact tracing effort underway after all of the events that the president has attended in the past week. How much concern is there about just how many people could be affected? Well, there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of concern in official Washington. Uh, I would say that the event that has uh, the most people concerned is the Rose Garden event where uh, the president announced his choice for a Supreme Court nominee. Uh, this, you saw the event, Lindsay. We made comments of it at the time. Uh, a lot of people crowded shoulder to shoulder in the Rose Garden, including a number of Republican senators, uh, a number of cabinet members, uh, and a lot of official Republican Washington all there. And now we 
have seen uh, Senator Mike Lee, one of the Republican senators there, has tested positive. Uh, so has the president of Notre Dame University, where uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett went, to, uh, was a professor. Uh, the, the president uh, has tested positive. He was seen there not wearing a mask. Uh, and then, of course, the president went to the fundraiser uh, with about 100 of his uh, top dollar supporters on yet just yesterday uh, in New Jersey at his uh, Bedminster Resort. Uh, certainly a lot of contract tracing needing to be done there. Uh, a lot of people have had contact with the president uh, and quite a few with Hope Hicks as well. Jonathan, Carl, I know you've been reporting nonstop for hours. We so appreciate it. The president's diagnosis has significant implications for the race for the White House, of course. The Trump campaign says all previously announced events with the president will be held virtually or postponed. Meanwhile, after testing negative for COVID-19 today, Joe Biden headed to a campaign stop in Grand Rapids, Michigan, offering words of support for the president and first lady. So just how will the president's diagnosis change the campaign? Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. With the news breaking shortly before 1 a.m. that the president and the first lady tested positive for coronavirus, there was immediate concern for the 77-year-old Joe Biden, whether or not he might have been infected too, after spending more than 90 minutes on that debate stage in Cleveland with the president. Biden Tuesday taking Trump to task over his handling of the pandemic. He's been totally irresponsible the way in which he has handled the, the social distancing and people wearing masks, basically encouraged them not to. All right. Ben, he's a fool on this. If you the podiums socially distanced over 13 feet apart, but no masks. The president often shouting over Biden. The you question want to put is, a lot of the new question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut up, your, man? Listen. In the audience that night, Jill Biden, her face covered, a sharp contrast to those images of Trump's family and members of his inner circle, violating the rules of the Cleveland Clinic, which hosted the debate. When this health care worker tried to give them masks, they refused. It wasn't until mid-morning that we learned the former vice president was being tested, the country then waiting several hours for the results to come in. Just after noon, Biden tweeting, I'm happy to report that Jill and I have tested negative for COVID. Thank you to everyone for your messages of concern. Biden taking two tests, both negative, before getting back on the trail. On the ground in Michigan, wishing the first family well. My wife Jill and I prayed that they'll make a quick and full recovery. This is not a matter of politics. It's a bracing reminder to all of us that we have to take this virus seriously. With his mask on for the entire speech, Biden imploring Americans to wear them too. So be patriotic. It's not about being a tough guy. It's about doing your part. Wearing a mask is not only going to protect you, but it also protects those around you. Those masks ever increasingly important. Mary Bruce joins us now. Uh, of course, this all just completely upends the campaign. What's the Biden campaign saying about how they plan to adapt? And could those future debates, including the planned VP debate on Wednesday, be impacted? Yeah, those debates right now are such a key question. We have two more presidential debates, and right now it is hard to see how they're going to go ahead as scheduled. The next face-off between Joe Biden and President Trump is set for just two weeks from now on October 15th. And, of course, the vice presidential debate is set for next Wednesday. And even though Mike Pence has tested negative, there are questions about whether he needs to be isolating and whether they can continue to go ahead with that as well. Uh, on the bigger picture here, look, the Biden campaign appears to still be full steam ahead. They have not canceled any of their planned events, but the former vice president is changing his message. We've seen today his campaign pull down their negative ads uh, in a bit of an overture to the president as he goes through this horrific experience, and he is tempering his sharp attacks against the president. We didn't hear any of those during Biden's campaign event earlier today. Instead, the former vice president calling for unity, saying this is a time for the country to come together. Lindsay. And Mary, of course, Biden went forward with that Michigan event today after his negative test, but is there any sense that the campaign is concerned that he could still be at risk for testing positive after that time on the debate stage with the president? Yeah, there were very serious questions today when we learned that Joe Biden was going ahead and getting back out on the campaign trail, given the fact that just a few days ago he spent 90 minutes, just 13 feet apart, from the president on that debate stage, not wearing masks, of course, throughout the debate. But Biden's team says they felt comfortable with him getting back out on the, out on the road for really three main reasons. One, being that he's tested negative. We know he had those two negative tests. Two, that he didn't come into close contact with the president. There was some question about 
whether they crossed paths behind the stage at the debate. It seems that did not happen. And three, they say that the vice president and his campaign follow all of the safety precautions. You saw him today wearing that mask throughout his entire remarks. They have always followed the guidance very strictly. I can tell you, having been at many of his campaign events now, they take these things very seriously. They're going to continue to do that. They say all of that combined gives them enough confidence to be back out there on the campaign trail. But in the past, and, and I know that you've been there many times, when he would start speaking at the podium, he would take his mask off, which was a difference from what we saw today, right? It is a bit of a difference. Now, it has depended on where he is. When he's in a very controlled setting, like some of those press conferences that I have attended, we all are six feet apart um, in, in a setting that the campaign is really controlling. He, he usually takes his mask off once he gets to the podium. He does that sometimes on the road. You have seen other times on the trail, he keeps his mask on completely. Uh, I think today was probably mostly about sending a message as he was hammering home his point that those masks can save lives and, as he calls them, a patriotic part of uh, every American's duty. Mary Bruce, thanks so much as always. And switching gears now, let's bring in Trump campaign senior advisor Corey Lewandowski. First off, let's just say our thoughts are with the first family, Hope Hicks, and all those in the White House who have been impacted. Have you gotten a chance to speak with the president today? And what's the latest that you can tell us about the president's condition as he arrived at, at Walter Reed? You know, thanks for having me. You know, I have not spoken to the president today. I know that he and the first lady have been in close consultation with their doctors and their other family members. Obviously, the decision was made sometime this afternoon to move the president to Walter Reed Medical Facility so he can have the 24-hour care that uh, would be expected at a facility like that. They clearly much more capable of providing any kind of uh, maintenance or care that would be required for the president in that type of facility as opposed to staying in the White House. And the, w knowing the president the way that I do, uh, I am certain that he was hesitant and wanted to stay at the White House, wanted to keep doing his day job. But uh, I think over uh, as an abundance of caution, the president acquiesced and decided to go up to Walter Reed today. I know it's still early since this diagnosis, but how concerned should the American public be about the president's health and, and how this could impact his ability to do the job? Well, we know the president to be a fighter. He's a fighter in everything he does. And for the seven, almost eight years now that I've known the president, I've never known him to spend one day inside of a hospital other than a routine checkup, which the American people have always had the opportunity since he's been the president to see the medications he's on and, and see the full litany of tests and battery that he has gone through. So uh, I've never known the president to have a sick day or a down day since I've known him. And so this is outside the ordinary for him. And I'm sure he didn't want to do it, but he understands the severity of the COVID crisis and, and the pandemic that's encircling the globe and what it's doing to he and the first lady. And therefore, uh, under the advice of his doctor, he went over to the Walter Reed. And right, yeah, his oldest son also saying today that he had never seen his father sick. But this, of course, will have a major impact on how the president campaigns in the weeks ahead, with just 32 days left until Election Day. Do you anticipate him being able to campaign in person at all again? And do you see these remaining presidential debates happening? Well, it's a great question. And look, the number one priority is obviously the health and uh, security of the first family. And so because of that, uh, I don't know exactly. I'm not a physician. I don't know what the diagnosis is or how long it takes to recover. But I know this president to be a fighter. I would envision that he'll be back on the campaign trail. You know, prior to this, last week, he was doing three and four rallies a day. He was supposed to be in Florida tonight and then two rallies tomorrow in Wisconsin. Those have obviously been postponed. Uh, our media campaign has postponed all of our activities where the president was supposed to be. So we're going to make sure that he gets better first. I believe the debates are going to continue. Uh, you know, we've got a debate scheduled with the vice president next and Kamala Harris. That right now is planned to go forward as scheduled. And then two more additional presidential, presidential debates, which will take place at the end of this month. So the American people can see the differences between this president and Joe Biden. As you well know, the president has been criticized for holding large in-person rallies with mostly maskless supporters packed together. I know you've said before that, that you support people wearing masks, but it shouldn't be mandated and that masks are given out to all rally attendees. But would you say in your estimation that it would have, could have had a huge impact on public health and encouraging mask use if the president had just looked out at the sea of people and said, hey, would everybody put a mask on? 
You know, I don't know. I mean, look, the, the real question is, at what point do you have personal responsibility and at what point do you have a government that tells people what to do every day? And, you know, there has to be a level of personal responsibility. You know, in my home state of New Hampshire, we don't have a seatbelt law if you're over 18 years old. That's not to say I don't wear my seatbelt, but it should be up to the individual to decide if you want to be safe in your vehicle. And I, while I choose to wear my seatbelt every day, I know it's a right that I have because my government hasn't mandated it. So, you know, we hand out masks at every rally. We provide hand sanitizer, all of our literature as we're asking people to come to these outdoor rallies, tell people that they must wear their masks. The PA announcers at the rallies before the president arrives says that masks are mandated. And if somebody chooses to take off their mask, I don't know what we can do other than tell them that it's a requirement. So look, there is a level of personal responsibility. And as you look at the number of protocols and precautions that were put in place for people who work in the White House so that this very incident didn't happen. Clearly, either there was a shortfall somewhere or the protocols were breached. And I don't think they were breached, but it just goes to show how deadly this virus or dangerous this virus can be, that even with all those protocols in place, the president and the first lady still contracted it. Uh, but as you know, you can count on one hand the number of times the president has been seen at least publicly wearing a mask, and he's regularly mocked Joe Biden for wearing one, including on the debate stage on Tuesday. You are an advisor. You have the president's ear. Would you suggest to him that, that he perhaps should change his behavior and his message on wearing a mask? And, and even if individuals are testing negative, do those working on the campaign and in the White House need to regularly wear masks rather than simply making it optional? You know, people, people sh should wear masks if they feel that it's important to them. And look, here's the thing. Um, when you go to the White House, the procedures are very clear after you've come through the security checkpoints. Uh, you go directly down to where the physicians are. You subject yourself to a nasal swab. You then await those results before you're even allowed to leave that general vicinity. And, you know, most people feel fairly confident in the results that they're getting from those doctors. And so I understand that maybe in some instances, there's been a lax of wearing masks uh, on the White House campus after every person has been tested. But I can tell you, I was at a event on Wednesday night with the president where every person was COVID tested before being allowed into the building. We practiced social distancing. There was rope and stanchion. The president didn't get within eight feet of anybody who was at that event. Even those who were scheduled for pictures had to stand eight feet from the president. Uh, there was no handshaking. There was no close proximity. And so those protocols have been in place in the past as it relates to this president. And honestly, you know, as you, as you see there, and it's an opportunity to maybe get relatively close to the president, people want to have their picture taken with the president. And if they were just tested and tested negative for COVID-19, I think they felt pretty good that they didn't have to have that mask on. I think we have to relook at those protocols and decide what we need to do moving forward. And you just mentioned that you've spent some time with the president in the past week, including on Wednesday, as you said. Uh, you've also tested negative in your visits to the White House. So have you been tested today? Are you planning to self-quarantine, given that you have had this recent contact with the president? I, I did test this afternoon. I went up to my local facility and I tested. I had a 15-minute rapid test, the Abbott test. It came back negative. But also, in addition to that, out of an abundance of caution, I took the larger nasal swab test, which is off and uh, takes about two days to come back. But I've already been tested today and tested negative. Corey Lewandowski, stay healthy. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. To say it will be difficult to contact trace the president's point of exposure is certainly an understatement. We first got an inkling of the potential risk to the president when we found out that Hope Hicks, his close aide, tested positive last night. But that does not mean that she gave it to him. We have seen him attending massive rallies as recently as this event in Minnesota. And as you heard earlier, we know of several people who attended Amy Coney Barrett's event at the White House last Saturday who have since become infected, including the president of Notre Dame University, not to mention that fundraiser in Bedminster, New Jersey. We can see the testing taking place here uh, ahead of that event. So let's bring in Rachel Scott, who covers the president for us and is at Walter Reed Hospital. First, Rachel, what's the situation right now on the ground? 
Yeah, well, earlier today we saw crowds of people gathering at the fences of the Walter Reed Medical Center just behind me as the president touched down. Some still lingering here today. The president is now inside. He's expected to stay here for the next few days, but we are told that the president will still be working. He'll be having some presidential offices set up inside for him, and he spent much of the day in self-isolation also working, though he is experiencing those mild symptoms. The White House uh, press secretary says that he is in good spirits here tonight, but he is expected to receive several tests over the next couple of days here at Walter Reed, Lindsay. And, and Rachel, paint a picture for us of the protocols and the procedures employed at the White House to help reduce the risk of COVID. You know, it is uh, very interesting, Lindsay. I have been in the White House um, lots of times through the course of this pandemic, and I can count on one hand the amount of times I have seen a White House staffer wear a face mask prior uh, to today from some of the images that are coming out. The White House is a very close quarters, especially in the West Wing. And so initially, when we saw the president's personal valet test positive, when we saw the vice president's uh, press secretary at the time, now communications director, test positive, we saw them kind of amp up uh, security protocols there. You had the temperature checks outside before you got in. Now we do know that, of course, everyone that is in immediate contact with the president is tested, but there are no mask mandates inside of the West Wing. It's a very tight quarter. It's hard to social distance there. And even Chris Christie, who was in that debate prep with the president uh, just a few days ago, said no one in the room was wearing a mask at the time, Lindsay. And earlier today, Chris Christie told our George Stephanopoulos that as of 5.30 p.m., he still had yet to be contacted by the White House, even though he was in the very same room as the president and Hope Hicks. What do we know about what kind, if any, contact tracing is taking place? Well, I think this is exactly what is causing so much anxiety among White House staffers uh, and, and so much fear, quite frankly, because so much is still unknown. Uh, the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, today said he expects more people in the administration to test positive over the next few days. He says more people may have been exposed to the virus. And so now all eyes are to see exactly uh, who does end up testing positive, what staffers. Uh, we know we have seen some of the ripple effects uh, so far, but so so much remains to be unseen, and especially tonight. I mean, what a stunning 24 hours. The president, less than 24 hours after announcing that he has tested positive for COVID-19, experiencing those symptoms, and then now spending a few days in one of the top hospitals uh, here in the nation. And Rachel, has the posture at the White House changed at all? I mean, we saw uh, people like the White House press secretary and the chief of staff without masks today, but did that change then later on? Yeah, you know, I think today as the president was leaving and departing on Marine One, we saw several White House staffers wearing a face mask. Again, that is something that has been rare over my experience in the last several months uh, covering the White House, uh, being inside of the West Wing in the lower press area. It's a rare sighting for, for me to see. Uh, but the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, as he was saying that he expects more people to test positive, he actually wasn't wearing a mask himself. And of course, this goes over into the campaign as well. I'm sure you were showing those images of the president's rallies where people are packed together, many people not wearing a mask. There is no mask mandate at those. Social distancing is not in force. And in fact, every single supporter that enters one of those arenas or airport hangars has to sign away their liability that if they get sick, they will not sue the president or the campaign, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, thank you so much. And joining us now to talk more about the science behind it all is epidemiologist and ABC News medical contributor, Dr. John Brownstein. Doctor, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Lindsay. So the president, is, of course, is now still in the very early stages of COVID-19, said to be experiencing mild symptoms. Give us some perspective on what could be considered, quote, mild symptoms, and, and tell us about what typically happens during those first few early days of the disease. How does the president's overall health picture also factor in? Right, well, clearly this has been quite a day because we heard about the mild symptoms earlier in the day. 
Um, and we have thought maybe there was a probability of a hospitalization. We know about 20% of the cases end up in a hospitalization. Well, already now we have the president at Walter Reed. So that in itself is a concern. Now, clearly we have to be, we have to understand that every individual is different. And, you know, we have very limited information about the president right now. But we do have concerns because of his age. We know that men have a higher risk of complications. And we also know about underlying conditions, right? Obesity, high blood pressure, all of this combined makes for a really high risk individual. Now, of course, he's getting incredible care and we, we see great outcomes from here, but we're gonna be watching for you know fever, shortness of breath, the need for oxygen. And clearly the real risk we have is whether this translates to an ICU visit, because from there, there's real risk beyond that of severe complications. So that's, you know, the next 10 days are gonna be incredibly uh, complicated that we'll have to be looking at closely to see how he does. And, and Vice President Mike Pence's office released a statement saying that he tested negative and is not considered a close contact with any individuals who have tested positive for COVID, including the president. We know that they met together just as recently as Tuesday. Scientifically, does that sound right? It, you know, the timeline doesn't really add up here because if you test positive, then as an epidemiologist, you want to look 48 hours to look at the contacts that you had. And clearly the president and the vice president had prolonged contact, you know, without mask wearing, without social distancing. And from that perspective, and according to the CDC guidelines, from that moment, that vice president needs to be in quarantine. We also have to remember that these tests, you know, are not perfect. They can generate false negatives. And regardless of the outcome of the test, we also know that there's a long incubation period of the virus. So it, it could take some days before he tests positive. So from here, he really needs to be in a quarantine phase for at least two weeks. And, and similarly, the Bidens, they have, of course, tested negative as well. But what kind of reassurance do they have? And when would you recommend that they get tested again? And for anybody out there who thinks that they may have been exposed, remind us again of, of the proper protocol. Yeah, I mean, this is reassuring that he tested negative and, and clearly that gives us some positive feedback. But, you know, actually, again, we have this incubation period that can last, you know, up to two weeks. Now, it's usually about three to five days. The debates were Tuesday. You know, he's likely not fully out of the woods, right? Yes, he had 13 feet of, of distance, but they were shouting at each other. There was, you know, prolonged 90 minute contact that does raise the risk. You know, there's nothing magical about six feet that generally is a good distance. But when you have a long time, Time period and a lot of spreading of you know of, of your of your aerosols that increases your risk. So clearly they need to be really thinking about the campaign in terms of their own quarantines, but also keeping that testing going because it is very possible he may end up positive in the days ahead. And we've certainly seen the White House use the rapid test to clear themselves from having to take some of the more typical precautions that they're advising and recommending for all Americans. I was just there last month and can tell you personally, we hardly saw anyone inside wearing masks. They seemed confident in those rapid tests. Would you say that that's the wrong approach to have so much confidence and rely on those test results? Yeah, testing is not a singular approach. That's not the way that you get out of this pandemic. Clearly, it's such an important concept, but it's really a part of a layered strategy, mask wearing, social distancing, and then testing, of course. But, you know, the White House isn't a perfect bubble. You know, people are coming in and out. They're having contacts. Clearly, people are not observing mask wearing the ways in which, you know, public health has really pushed. So from that perspective, even if testing was happening, you could get a false positive. The virus could be incubating and, and generate negative, but likely that person was eventually going to be infectious. So testing alone really wasn't going to protect the inner circle of the president and his team. So, you know, this is not actually unexpected, unfortunately. And finally, doctor, talk to us about the mental aspect of the pandemic. I mean, it's already been a long year. Many people are feeling over it. The president has admittedly been playing down the threat of the virus, but there's now hope that this serves as a wake up call to all Americans that anybody can get it. As an epidemiologist, what are the changes that you're hoping to see going forward from the American public as cases in many places continue to climb? Yeah, clearly we are all exhausted as, at this point, right? You know, we've been trying to push the science of these basic concepts like mask wearing, like social distancing, hand washing, and clearly that hasn't really sort of resonated with a good chunk of the U.S. population. 
and partly because of the narrative that is coming from the White House. Now, this is a real moment, right? This could be a real change in the narrative. It could be a change in how the White House is communicating about risk. And yes, to the American people recognizing that our leader is vulnerable to this virus, it may end up changing people's view of, of, of this virus, take it seriously, and for once and for all, really start observing the, the clear sort of data that we've seen around the, the ability to intervene with this virus, mask wearing, social distancing, all the things that we've been talking about for so many months. Such helpful and useful, potentially life-saving information. Dr. John Brownstein, thanks so much for your time tonight. Thank you. While it's still early since the president has been diagnosed, the federal government must be prepared in case the president's condition worsens or if he becomes incapacitated because of the coronavirus. The Constitution's 25th Amendment details an orderly temporary transfer of power. So let's bring in ABC's Terry Moran. Terry, break this down for us when this could be invoked and how it would work. Well, Lindsay, this is uh, available to President Trump initially for him to decide. The Constitution specifies if the president uh, believes that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of the office, he can temporarily uh, assign them to the vice president, Mike Pence, who we should say has tested negative for coronavirus. And he does that simply by writing a letter declaring that uh, to the Speaker of the House and the president pro tempore of the Senate. Uh, at that point, Vice President Pence would become acting president. When the president recovers, he'd write another letter saying, I'm better, and the powers flow back to him. The problem is uh, that in a situation like this, when the president is ill with a very serious, a potentially serious disease, if he falls ill before he gets a chance to write those, those uh, letters, then uh, it would be up to Vice President Mike Pence to convene the cabinet. This is under the Constitution. And the cabinet would vote and decide whether or not President Trump can continue discharging Charging those powers and duties. If they vote, if they say no, then Mike Pence becomes the acting president. We should say this has only happened three times in, in our history, uh, and all during elective surgeries. Ronald Reagan during a surgery, George Bush during uh, George W. Bush during two surgeries. They decided voluntarily to make their vice presidents for very brief periods of time, a few hours, the temporary acting presidents. This is a very different, unprecedented situation. But interesting to note that Ronald Reagan did not invoke that when he was shot in 1981. And, and Terry, this diagnosis comes as the Senate is moving fast to try to confirm the president's Supreme Court nominee judge, Amy Coney Barrett. Will that process at all have to be delayed? Well, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says no. Uh, he wants to keep this nomination on a fast track before the uh, election, uh, and that could be challenging because there are Senator Mike Lee, who's on the Senate Judiciary Committee, has announced he's tested positive. And right now it does look as if this coronavirus is moving through some of the top echelons of the Republican Party. They do need to see contact trace, test, see who might else have had it. And then they have to think about the workers in the Senate building where this hearing would be held, uh, and, and others, staff, who might be exposed as well. I think it, it would be seen as bad form right now to rush through with it, wait a few days, see how things are in that contact testing and tracing, uh, and maybe move forward then. But they are determined to get her on the court as soon as possible. Terry Moran, thank you so much. And when we come back, our look at how other global leaders who have battled COVID beat the virus. The president's approach to COVID has long been documented. We'll look at his evolution on the virus. But first, on any other ordinary day, this would have been the big headline. The grand jury audio in the Breonna Taylor case was released today. We'll play a portion of it coming up. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart not. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Americans here on the ground and the Iraq. 18,000 tons. Matata. Ismail. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. The waters of the Outer Banks are unforgiving. 
and full of riches for the fishermen who dare. The best of the northern fleet are heading south. But the locals know where the giants lie. And if you thought the waters were unforgiving, wait until the battle begins. Wicked Tuna Outer Banks. New episode Sundays at 9 on National Geographic. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. I woke up to a text message this morning about President Trump um, and Melania having COVID. And my first reaction was, oh my God. And then um, I saw the stock market had dropped. So apparently that's the reaction across the entire world. And maybe he might take it a little more seriously and also kind of encourage the American people to no, to take it seriously, wear your mask, practice social distancing. Last night I decided to put the news on, so I was up till about three in the morning on Twitter and Facebook. There were so many what ifs before this happened, and now the what ifs just got multiplied by 10. They wasn't wearing their masks. So that's how they got, they came in contact with people who wasn't wearing their masks. They didn't listen to the rules. Just heard some voters there reacting to the news that President Trump tested positive for COVID. We turn now to a highly unusual move in the Breonna Taylor case. Today, the Kentucky Attorney General released 15 hours of audio tape from the two and a half day grand jury investigation into Taylor's death after a judge ordered it. That grand jury did not charge any officers with Taylor's death and just one former officer with endangering Taylor's neighbors. The prosecutor said this at the time. According to Kentucky law, the use of force by Mattingly and Cosgrove was justified to protect themselves. This justification bars us from pursuing criminal charges in Miss Brianna Taylor's death. That, of course, sparked outrage and protests. The tapes released today come after an anonymous member of the grand jury filed a lawsuit accusing the prosecutor of trying to deflect responsibility for the charging decision. ABC's Alex Perez has been pouring over these newly released tapes and joins us now. Thanks so much, Alex. So let's start off with what we learned today about the case, especially about the question of whether uh, those three officers announced themselves before barging into Breonna Taylor's home in the middle of the night. Well, Lindsay, first of all, we can't punctuate enough just how rare it is to have a look at the grand jury proceedings at this point in the criminal case. Now, in terms of what we learned from these uh, tapes when it comes to police barging in, uh, we've learned from, we knew from before that officers were serving a no-knock search warrant, but we've learned through testimony that they say once they arrive there, they discuss the fact that Jamarcus Glover, that's Breonna Taylor's ex-boyfriend and sort of the center of the warrant, had been taken taken into custody earlier that evening. So they say because of that, they turned this into a knock and announce warrant. And so several officers testified that they actually knocked and identified themselves before barging in. Now, we know that Brianna's boyfriend, who was Kenneth Walker, who was inside the home with her at the time, the apartment, he says police did not identify themselves. But several officers in testimony contradicting what Kenneth Walker said. One officer saying they knocked on the door for at least two minutes identifying themselves and then knocking, identifying themselves again and then knocking. In testimony, one of the officers described those few chaotic seconds when the they barged through that door and the gunfire began. Let's take a quick listen to some of that testimony describing the chaos. So at the threshold of the door, I am immediately overwhelmed with bright flashes and darkness. Thank you. 
And so there in that audio recording, we hear one of the officers in testimony describing those few seconds, calling it chaotic, saying he saw a lot of flashing lights and then suddenly everything went dark. Also saying that it happened very, very quickly. And Lindsay, we know it was in those seconds that Brianna Taylor was shot and died almost instantly there on the scene, Lindsay. And as we heard earlier, the Kentucky Attorney General said publicly that two of the officers were, quote, justified in firing into Taylor's home because her boyfriend friend fired first. Do we know if the attorney general said that to the grand jury and was that the grand jury's conclusion as well? Well, Lindsay, from listening to what the attorney general has said publicly and hearing all of the information on these tapes, we know that the attorney general never presented a case on those other two officers to the grand jury. So they did not reach any conclusion when it comes to those two other officers because the attorney general said from the beginning, because Kenneth Walker fired at them, they were justified in using their weapons. And so there was no case to move forward with the grand jury. They never heard anything on those other two officers, Lindsay. And, and we also know that some of the grand jury proceedings were not recorded and made public. Why was, why was that the case and, and what was left off? Well, Lindsay, the attorney general says this is customary. Customary. The prosecutor's statements, their recommendation to the jurors, and the jury deliberations themselves, those things were not recorded, and because of that, were not part of this release that was made to the public today. Uh, the attorney general says they just don't record those portions of it because that's not considered evidence. Only the evidence is recorded. So those moments, those things, we won't actually ever know, Lindsay. Alex Perez, thanks so much for your reporting. Still ahead here on Prime, lawmakers leaving Washington without making a COVID relief deal. We're tracking other news in today's rundown, like the search for the suspect who attacked actor Rick Moranis on the streets of New York. But up next, our look at the overall amount of people infected on the same day as the president and first lady. But first, our tweet of the day, how the president notified us about his condition. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. Do you trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. 24-7. ABC News. There for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. With the stunning news that President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump have tested positive for COVID-19, I want to take a step back and look at the surge of infections in this country by the numbers. 
President Trump is just one of the 44,717 Americans who were newly diagnosed with COVID-19 in a single day, bringing the total U.S. case count to more than 7.3 million and still rising. Cases are now surging in 32 states and hospitalizations are rising in 26 states. More than 30,000 people are currently hospitalized with COVID-19 across the country. In Wisconsin, where President Trump was planning to hold rallies, hospitalizations are up a record 17 percent. And the Washington, D.C. metro area just saw a daily rise of 1,743 cases. That's the highest single day rise in weeks, according to The Washington Post. And sadly, more than 208,000 Americans have already lost their lives to this terrible disease. Still lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Our conversation with one woman, her father was killed by COVID. She was invited to the debate by Biden and and was in feet of the president. We'll examine how foreign actors may try to exploit this moment and we'll ask the question, can we postpone the election? What about those Supreme Court hearings? Do the lawmakers have to be present physically? But first, here's a look at the trending stories on abcnews.com. of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC see. News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Good spirits. Uh, uh, the president does have mild symptoms. The situation appears to be, have become somewhat more serious. The president reported to have a fever, chills, and a cough, the classic symptoms of COVID. Also reported to be taking uh, an, an experimental drug. White House released a statement from the president's doctor saying he has been treated with a, quote, polyclonal antibody cocktail, as well as zinc, vitamin D, famitotidine, melatonin, and a daily aspirin. As of this afternoon, the doctor wrote, the president remains fatigued but in good spirits. He's being evaluated by a team of experts and together we'll be making recommendations to the president and first lady in regard to the next steps. Joe Biden just sent out a tweet, quote, this cannot be a partisan moment and must be an American moment. We have to come together as a nation. California is about to hit a grim milestone. Wildfires burning 4 million acres in the state, whipping winds triggering new red flag warnings in Northern California. And really unfortunate photos and videos coming out of the glass fire. So this is now 59,000 acres burned. It is 5% contained. There have been 220 homes destroyed. 
in both Napa and Sonoma counties. You can see in this video somebody checking for what looks like chickens and getting livestock out there. First Lady Melania Trump like we've never heard her before in secret recordings made by Stephanie Winston Wolkoff in the summer of 2018 and obtained by CNN on public perceptions of her I don't, I don't give a f it's not about giving a f or the president's controversial policy separating children from their parents after being captured crossing the border from Mexico. They are taking care nicely there, but you know, yeah, they are not with parents. It's sad, but when they come here alone or with coyotes or illegally, you know, you need to you need to do something. But that's not what she told Tom Yamas two years ago. We interviewed mothers who were crying, saying they'd been separated for eight months from their children. A separation, yes. It was unacceptable for me to, to see children and parents separated. It was heartbreaking. You know, it was under your, your husband's policy, the zero tolerance policy, that these families were separated, that enforcement. Is this somewhere where you disagreed with him? Uh, yes, and I let him know. Um, I, I didn't know that that policy would come out. I was blindsided by it. And what about that jacket she wore after visiting those kids? So what, what prompted you to want to buy that jacket? <laughs> I'm driving liberals crazy, that's for sure. And that's, you know, that's what and they, they deserve it. Intense fighting is still continuing tonight between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh, almost a week after the decades-old conflict reignited. Both sides are using heavy artillery, aircraft and drones in the worst fighting around the enclave since the 1990s. Dozens have been killed, hundreds injured. France, Russia and the US have called for a ceasefire. Armenia today said it's ready to try for ceasefire talks, but there's little sign right now that Azerbaijan and its key backer Turkey are willing to. It's believed Turkish-backed rebel fighters from Syria are being sent to help Azerbaijan, a new factor in this intractable conflict that's stoking fears it could further escalate into a full-scale war. Patrick Rival, ABC News, Yerevan, Armenia. The labor market slowing last month. Our recovery is downshifting. So quite frankly, that's not the best news that we could have gotten. We saw a slight improvement in the unemployment rate, of course, but really what a lot of economists are focused on is the fact that fewer jobs were added to the U.S. economy than anticipated. And that's really showing that we're in a stall position right now. More people are on the sidelines, whether that's by choice, whether they've been laid off. The bottom line is, more people are sitting out. Ghostbusters actor Rick Moranis is recovering from an unprovoked attack in Manhattan that was caught on camera. It happened yesterday on West 70th Street near Central Park on the Upper West Side. The attacker was walking by Moranis when he suddenly punched the 67-year-old actor in the head, knocking him to the ground. The attacker then just kept walking. Moranis suffered pain in his head, back, and hip, but is expected to recover. So far, no arrests. Welcome back. We want to give you another update on President Trump's health and the fallout from his positive COVID test. He left the White House earlier this evening, walking onto Marine One after a short wave and wearing a mask. His doctor described him as fatigued but in good spirits. In a video posted to Twitter, the president said, I think I'm doing very well, but we're going to make sure that things work out. The president landed at Walter Reed just before 6.30 p.m. That's where he remains at this hour. Former Vice President Joe Biden and his wife Jill confirmed today they tested negative. Biden, of course, faced off against Trump in the presidential debate on Tuesday night. Biden did have a campaign event in Michigan. His campaign also announced that they have pulled all negative ads. Vice President Pence also tested negative today. We, of course, keep monitoring his health and are standing by to keep you updated on any breaking developments. And as we reported earlier, as a precautionary measure, the president has received a, an experimental antibody cocktail. Earlier this evening, our George Stephanopoulos talked with one of the founders of that company that manufactures the experimental antibody cocktail. Uh, Dr. Yankopoulos, tell us about the significance of the 8-gram dose and what you've seen so far in your results. First, I should just correct one thing. It's a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies. So it's a monoclonal antibody cocktail. Uh, uh, the White I House called it polyclonal. 
I, I think that that was just uh, an error in, in transcription. Okay. Um, the medical consultants looked at all the data and decided that this, because of its uh, apparently uh, strong data suggesting antiviral activity, lowering of the virus, and potential to help people exactly in this situation. They deem that based on the risk benefit, it'd be worth trying it. Uh, we tested two doses in our trial. Uh, they went with the high dose, uh, and I guess once again, they assessed that there were no increased safety. There were very few reasons to have concerns about safety or tolerability based on our trial, and then I guess they decided more is better, and they went with the high dose, the eight gram dose. And have you seen any side effects in those you've treated? Right now, we have in our, our studies a very uh, benign safety and tolerability profile. This tends to be the case with these monoclonal antibody treatments. Obviously, we have a long history of this. Um, and we all have to remember, it's very different than vaccines. Vaccines are inducing an immune response, and sometimes they can overinduce, and that's why there's all these concerns about side effects. We're actually giving these antibodies. We're substituting for your own antibodies, and you don't tend to get the same concerns and worries about overinducing the endogenous immune response by simply providing these inert antibodies on the outside. For months, the president has downplayed the pandemic to the American people, claiming he didn't want to cause more panic. The president hosted and attended various crowded rallies. He was rarely seen in public wearing a mask, despite the recommendations from top officials. He even as recently as this week mocked Biden for wearing masks. But as Tom Yamas reports, the president has now learned firsthand why we cannot afford to dismiss the threat of this pandemic. The president's positive test comes after months of a dangerous gamble, downplaying COVID-19, floating public health regulations, and minimizing the dangers of the virus. I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. The president has also frequently criticized his own scientist for recommendations on masks, and just three days ago, attacked opponent Joe Biden for regularly wearing one. I don't have to, I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Despite the science, the president admitting when it comes to wearing a mask, he just doesn't want to do it. Well, I just don't want to wear one myself. It's a recommendation. They recommend it. Uh, I'm feeling good. I just don't want to be doing, I don't know, somehow sitting in the Oval Office behind that beautiful resolute desk. The great resolute desk, I think, uh, wearing a face mask as I greet presidents, prime ministers, dictators, kings, queens, I don't know, somehow, I don't see it for myself. I just, I just, uh, maybe I'll change my mind, but uh, this will pass. Even mocking reporters wearing them in briefings. Take that off, please. Just, you can take I'll, it off. Your, your health, how many feet are you away? I'll speak a lot louder. Well, if you don't take it off, you're very muffled. In fact, it was July, months after his CDC revised guidance on wearing masks before the president ever donned one in public, first appearing with a mask at Walter Reed Hospital to meet with veterans. I can name Kung Flu. I can name 19 different versions of names. The president held his first indoor rally in Tulsa in late June, where masks were not required, and most chose not to wear one, including one-time GOP presidential candidate Herman Cain, who died from complications of COVID-19, though it's unknown where or when he contracted the virus. The president has held 25 more rallies since. What are they going to do? You know, someday we're not going to be doing this anymore. What are they going to do without Trump? holding crowded events at a church in Arizona and this factory in Nevada, prompting fines from the state, insisting he's safe in front of his supporters, though backstage... You're actually sitting too close. You should really, we should probably get rid of about another 75, 80 percent of you. I'll have just two or three that I like in this room. Even going head to head with the governor of North Carolina after state regulations forced the RNC to drastically change its plans on the convention. I think your governor has to let this state open up. Eventually, the president delivering his convention speech from the White House lawn in front of a crowd of 1,500, many without masks, sitting shoulder to shoulder. 
Our thanks to Tom Yamas for that. And, and joining us now is someone who was in the audience at Tuesday's debate, sitting just 15 feet from the president. Sadly, Kristen Urquiza's dad passed away from COVID this summer. The San Francisco resident was at the debate at the invitation of the Biden campaign. Uh, thank you so much for your time and, and of course, our, our condolences for the loss of your father. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic, which hosted the debate, said today, quote, we believe there is low risk of exposure to our guests, and they were reaching out to everyone who attended. Have you spoken with them today, and were you able to get tested already? I haven't spoken to anyone at the Cleveland Clinic, um, and I have a scheduled test for tomorrow, but I did speak to folks at the Biden campaign, including uh, Dr. Biden, who were uh, very gracious and uh, informative to help me figure out just, you know, how to make sure that I was taken care of. And you were sitting very close to the front Tuesday. Kind of just give us a sense of, of what you saw. Walk us through it uh, and the difference between the Biden side um, and and the Trump, Trump side. Absolutely. Um, well, first off, uh, before I could even enter the debate hall, I had to get into town a day early so that I could get a COVID rapid test, quarantine. And that was what um, we were told everyone was required to do. Um, when I entered into the debate hall, I felt super comfortable. They took temperatures. There was lots of social distancing. But once we settled into our seats, there was a Biden side and a, a uh, Trump side. And as I gazed over to the Trump side, I saw maybe one, two people wearing masks. And then as I looked behind me, a sea of people who were masked. And I started to think to myself, wait, I think there's an indoor ordinance here. Why isn't this being enforced? Um, and then, you know, obviously, over the course of the the debate, uh, you know, Mr. Trump, President Trump himself was very, you know, vocal, and I just can't imagine, you know, how much, um, you know, potential viral load was, um, you know, set out from just him himself speaking for 90 minutes. And as we stated uh, in the very beginning, your dad passed away in Arizona over the summer. And you wrote in his obituary, and I want to quote, that his death was due to the carelessness of the politicians who continue to jeopardize the health of brown bodies through a clear lack of leadership, refusal to acknowledge the severity of this crisis, and inability and unwillingness to give clear and decisive direction on how to minimize risk. What do you feel needs to change now? We need a coordinated, data-driven response to this pandemic. And as we see this week, politicians like Donald Trump and his family are continuing to put politics above public health. Uh, the Trump family arrived so late to the debate, I just learned this uh, 20 minutes ago, that they weren't even tested. And then looking at the timeline, it seems like they knew people in their inner circle were uh, positive as they continued to campaign. In what universe is this acceptable? This is life and death. I have seen up close the darkest sides of COVID. It is undignified and lonely death. And I have been saying this since the day my dad got sick. I would never wish this disease on my worst enemy. Uh, just for the record, I uh, want to establish that ABC News has not confirmed that the Trump family did have that knowledge that uh, people in their inner circle had tested positive at this time. But, uh, but moving forward, as you know, personally, this virus spares no one. You've seen that firsthand. What would you say has helped get you through this difficult time? And do you have advice for the countless families who, who may be going through the same emotions that you are? The thing that has brought me so much um, solace in a time where it's really difficult to connect and breathe through traditional channels is actually the nonprofit that I co-founded called Marked by COVID, where we're working with other families who are survivors or been impacted to help uplift their stories um, and really channel their anger and pain and grief into purpose. Uh, we're also uh, launching a week of mourning starting this Sunday where we're going to be hosting uh, daily vigils at noon Eastern for folks to come together and, and publicly mourn and start to grieve and heal. And working alongside these families and seeing um, just my own suffering replicated throughout tens of thousands of people across the country is, is 
it's actually less, um, it's empowering in a sense because I know that I'm not alone and that what I'm calling for and asking for is, is righteous and necessary. You certainly um, are not alone. Kristen Urquizo, thank you so much for your time and, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. As you can imagine, President Trump's diagnosis is making headlines around the world. Foreign leaders reaching out with best wishes, including Brazil's president and the UK prime minister, both of them COVID survivors as well. ABC's senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel has more. Tonight, the shock expressed around the world for President Trump and the First Lady. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson wishing them a speedy recovery. Johnson himself battled COVID and was criticised for not taking precautions. I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were, a few, there were actually a few coronavirus uh, patients and I shook hands with everybody. He tested positive less than four weeks later, insisting his initial symptoms, like the president's today, were just mild. But his health took a turn for the worse, spending three nights in intensive care, handing temporary powers to his foreign minister, later admitting things could have gone either way. It was a wake-up call for a leader who, like Donald Trump and President Bolsonaro of Brazil, has been accused by some of downplaying the threat of COVID-19, only to later get infected. And Ian Panel joins us now. And Ian, as you said, it was really a wake-up call for Boris Johnson, who was one of the first global leaders to actually be diagnosed. Walk us through his timeline. I mean, he experienced mild symptoms for several days before things really escalated. Yeah, that's right. It was actually 10 days after. So at the beginning of the month, he was caught on camera uh, saying that he was still shaking hands with people. In fact, he even bragged that he'd gone to a hospital and shaken hands with people who had tested positive uh, for COVID-19. Within four weeks, in fact, it was less than four weeks, three and a half weeks, he had contracted the virus himself. He was faced with accusations that he wasn't taking it seriously enough, just like President Trump, just like uh, President Bolsonaro, for example, of Brazil. Uh, ten days later, he continued to work. He was tweeting. He was releasing selfie videos saying he just had mild symptoms, the very thing that we're now hearing from the White House. But 10 days later, he was admitted to uh, St. Thomas's Hospital here in London, just across the River Thames from the Houses of Parliament. And he was eventually rushed into the ICU uh, where he had to receive oxygen. Even Boris Johnson himself said uh, when he was thanking the nurses when he was finally released that at one point it was touch and go. And I think that just underlines however it looks right now, once you've got this virus, there are no guarantees how it's going to look in five days' time or ten days' time. And it really shook things up here in the country and his sense of how serious this was. And during that time, was there any sense in either the UK or Brazil that their illness had an effect on national operations? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it had a palpable psychological effect, certainly here. I think in Brazil, less so because uh, uh, President Bolsonaro has always been something of an outlier. Um, and he, right from the get-go, set himself against the virus. Uh, he also called it just a little flu. Um, he advocated the use of this hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine, something that the president says uh, that he's been taking, this anti-malarial drug. Boris Johnson wasn't quite there. He was guilty, if anything. Uh, of not taking it seriously, of not putting in the right kind of measures. But it had a huge psychological effect. It showed the country that if the prime minister could get it, then anyone could get it. That this was an illness that didn't respect age, didn't respect sex, and didn't respect power, and that anybody was vulnerable. And just for a moment, the prospect of losing the leader of the country became very real. It didn't really matter whether you supported Boris Johnson or not. This was clearly something the country didn't need in a time of crisis, uh, and the same for Brazil. And you have to be the judge of this. I'm sure there are many in America, whether they like the president or not, no one wants to see him ill. Right. I, I think that we're experiencing that same scenario here. And Ian, we're also hearing from uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin tonight. You know, several world leaders have been tweeting their, their thoughts and, and prayers. He's not really a Twitter kind of guy. 
No, that's right, he isn't. He sends a telegram, uh, which was something of a revelation that, that they still exist. Um, but yes, it was very kind, it was very thoughtful. Um, he spoke to the president's humour uh, and his courage, and he felt that this was something that the president uh, would get through. I think this is a time where countries, nations, leaders try and rally round rather than a chance for scoring political points, either domestically or internationally. Uh, this is not good for the political, uh, political order. Again, irrespective of what anyone happens to think of the current administration, the current White House, uh, the President of the United States is still the most powerful person in the world, still at least technically represents the free world, and uh, what happens in America affects the rest of us. And so stability, continuity are important things, even in a time of crisis. Certainly many putting politics aside. Ian Panel, thanks so much. And joining us now is President Trump's former Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor and ABC News contributor Tom Bossert. Thanks for your time, Tom. You've, of course, criticized the president and administration in the past for downplaying the virus. Just today, we saw his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, without a mask as he was briefing reporters. And we learned that there will still be no mask mandate at the White House, a White House memo saying that it's a personal choice. Do you think that the president and first lady testing positive will be any sort of wake up call to change how the administration administration deals with COVID. Yeah, I hope so. I, you know, there's there's really no debating it anymore. It looks like the numbers, unfortunately, are starting to show both increases in the age demographic of high school and college kids and the older generations around those schools. And so that's bad news. It indicates that we might see a, an increase in the uh, new death case tolls or the new the new death rates, you know, all through November. And that's really a bad sign. It shows a lot of sickness in 25 to 30 states. And, and it shows a lot of people getting sick right now now in Washington, D.C., so that means there's more virus in the city and in places where we might have large gatherings, and that's where these super spreader concerns take hold. So hopefully all the young staff uh, in and around uh, Washington, D.C., and around the president and campaigns understand how serious this is. And if we can't keep the disease away from the president of the United States, we're really not going to have a, a, an easy time keeping the disease from any other uh, elderly person in this country. You know, there's a myth that sounds like really, really attractive that well, all we have to do is keep it away from people that are in certain age demographics. And uh, that's just uh, uh, really tragic evidence that that's not possible. And, 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 you know, listen, it's not a time to criticize the president at all. It's really a time for well wishes. I will say one thing about the last, uh, the last speaker in that conversation. The one contrary point to the rule of everyone saying good things and wishing well to the president seems to be the Chinese state media today. They took an opportunity to start taking pot shots at the president mocking him for his treatment of this and it's really troubling for how they're viewing this opportunity and you worked of course with the president if you were still in the White House how would you advise his teams dealing with the unfolding medical situation and transparency I mean, would you say in your estimation that it's better to widely share information or for national security implications not reveal too much well, there's some things that you know have to be kept close hold with the with respect to the president's condition and his health. You know, his health condition. He's a he's a human being, and his health condition is private as a general matter. But there are larger conditions. Listen, in addition to being the Homeland Security Advisor, I had another really unique role. One I was instrumental in creating after 9/11 for people that were then my bosses, and that is the National Continuity Coordinator. It was my responsibility to coordinate the continuity not only of the federal government, but to interact with with the other branches of government to make sure that we had an enduring constitutional government. All three branches surviving and having their operations continue, or at least their mission essential functions continue through any circumstance, was our objective. So right now I'd be telling Vice President Pence despite his instinct to get out and get on the campaign trail, that he's got a larger obligation to the Constitution and the country. He needs to sit himself down, get somewhere where he's not exposed, not take any risk. And, uh, you know, although the president's condition from public reporting seems to be uh, fair, he seems to only have minor uh, symptoms, uh, the vice president can't take that chance. He's in the line of succession, and he's going to go have to park himself somewhere. And then secondly, I'd be communicating with the others in line of succession, but more to the point of keeping the Congress and the Supreme Court in similar good health so that all three branches can continue to operate at the same time. Uh, just curious, I know that that's your advice that the vice president should park himself somewhere. Do you think that that will happen? 
Well, right now there's still some indication that he intends to go out and continue some of his uh, planned campaigning. Uh, I don't know what the inside conversations are right now, but if he's uh, interested in my two cents, I'd be giving him a really strong uh, caution not to do that. I suspect that the chief of staff uh, on his team and the president's chief of staff are probably hearing that kind of advice right now. Uh, the White House military office seems to be taking uh, continuity precautions for the continuity of the presidency, and I suspect that they're giving him all sorts of alternatives and opportunities to take this advice. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're not saying it today that they uh, choose to take this advice by tomorrow. And, and really staying on those same lines, what do you think that the Trump administration needs to be doing right now to control the spread of the virus within its own ranks and also what needs to be done to keep the wheels of the government working? Well, if that advice that you read earlier is accurate, that they're saying that it's still a personal choice on masks, it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of the mask advice. It's just one of many, uh, you know, really prophylactics. It's not a cure, of course. But the idea of a mask isn't just simply a personal choice. It's a, it's a matter of collective responsibility. So the messaging on this has to be clearer. There's been so much confusion. It's almost difficult to continue to repeat myself, uh, not to you, but to a lot of the people that spread misinformation about this virus. Uh, we know how it spreads. We've known how it spreads and the rate at which it spreads since the Diamond Princess cruise ship. There's been no change in that. Uh, we know the, uh, the, the characteristics and properties of the virus at its root. And what we don't know or don't seem to really get through our minds as a country is the, the difference between our behavior today and this big lag in consequences tomorrow. So as I said at the start, at the outset of this conversation, I think that we're going to see those numbers uh, yield, the increasing numbers right now, yield really increased death rates or new death rates in November. Hard for people to understand that there's a 30-day lag between between what they do today and what they, they might experience 30 days from now. So my advice to the uh, president and to the task force would be to, uh, you know, to send out some clear messaging. And it would also be for them to not only in embrace the mask wearing, but it would be to clarify misperceptions about the availability and time frame for, you know, uh, for vaccines. It's, it's pretty clear that vaccines will be available, you know, sometime uh, second quarter next year uh, for the masses. And I think the masses are the important target audience here. That's a separate, entirely different message, and that's on pandemic alone. If I were him, I'd also be giving a very clear message uh, to our adversaries that now is not the time. Uh, we might be divided on how to respond to uh, this virus because of economic differences of opinion, but we will not be divided if anyone tries anything uh, you know, uh, militarily against our country or our interests abroad. And as we continue to near what it's already a very contentious election, and of course there are still so many unknowns, any concerns about domestic unrest that might come if, say, the 25th Amendment has to be invoked, meaning, of course, as you know, that the president is forced to temporarily step aside? Yeah, you know, I'd like to offer a few thoughts on that. Uh, we've heard some of the history, some really good history from Terry Moran uh, and others tonight that it's only been used three times, and they were all three times planned elective surgeries where the president knew he was going to be placed under, you know, full sedation. Uh, that's accurate. But in this case, I'd be looking for something entirely different. I wouldn't be waiting for sedation. In this case, it's not a surgical procedure that we're anticipating. Right now, we're hearing mild symptoms, and the president's very much in control of his family faculties, and that's good. And during that time frame, he should not give up authority to the vice president or anyone else. However, where we should all, the vice president and the family surrounding the president, as we all help him convalesce through this and send our prayers to him, where we should all be worried about it or the mark that we should all be looking to is if his condition deteriorates to the point where he needs to be placed on oxygen or, God forbid, if he needs to be intubated. Being placed on oxygen or being intubate, intubated uh, for a, a man of his age with, uh, with, with this virus would be a very bad sign, and that's when, if I were on his staff still, I'd be advising him to sign that letter and giving uh, Mike Pence the temporary authority to act as president. And I'll, I'll just kind of amplify that. We have no reason to believe the president's in a really bad place right now. He seems to have been hospitalized because he's the president of the United States, has access to these facilities and to the, the, the best care in the world, as he should. But if he were a regular citizen, not the president, not with so many responsibilities that we all count on him to execute, 
the, 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 the mortality, the hospitalization mortality rate for people in his age bracket is alarmingly high. Now, he was hospitalized, but not for the same conditions. But once somebody's hospitalized because their condition warrants it and not their position, uh, the, 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 the mortality rate is uh, almost 40% in three or four of the states that I looked up today. Uh, that's a, a really bad statistic. And so uh, that, that kind of outcome for people between 70 and 79 is bad. It goes up significantly, almost 80% mortality once you get into your 80s. So, you know, the president's right in the middle of that age demographic. And I think the vice president should probably be tapped on the shoulder if and when the president has to be placed on oxygen. We hope that never happens. And, and lastly, just big picture picture, you've been tracking the virus and the national containment efforts overall. As you know, cases continue to rise. Just how concerned are you about the winter? Well, I'm very concerned. You know, point blank, I think we're going to have a significant increase in the new death rate, uh, new, the new, new death and new cases. And, uh, you know, we, we've, re we've read a lot about super spreader events. Well, how do we identify a super spreader? Well, you don't. You don't know how. You, you, everyone wears a mask. You presume you might be contagious. And so you do that as a courtesy. But you also stop large events. You don't want to have large gatherings because large gatherings increase the odds that there may be a super spreader present and increase the target audience of people that could get sick, you know, infected from that super spreader. And so one of the key components was not to do that. And what we've done as a country, I believe, in an ill-advised way was to send people back to all, su uh, all sorts of super spreader events. Every, every college and university and high school that's come back to school right now uh, with large numbers is essentially a, a super spreader uh, event and it's happening on a daily basis as they reconvene together. So it looks like, as I said, the, the new cases for the young are going up alarmingly and I think quite predictably in the areas surrounding high schools and colleges that have gone back to school. And it looks like those uh, delayed lagging numbers are starting to creep into the older population set. So I look at the age demographics uh, for new cases. I don't look at national aggregated data. And in those places where both go up at the same time, uh, you're really, you know, uh, you know, signing a recipe for uh, increased death. And I suspect without really wanting to alarm people that where those conditions have grown into that red zone of, of 25 or more new cases a day, uh, we really need to think about doubling down our efforts to uh, stay away, isolate, quarantine, wear a mask, uh, and do all the other things that we've been told throughout this pandemic. And the reason being that we could end up not only with a big death, you know, spike in, in places where it's bad, but in this country, country we've only seen that in, in regionally contained areas like New York and New Jersey and the Northeast in the beginning. What we might end up seeing in this next round is, you know, increased sickness and death rates in many states and some of them in rural areas that we've seeded very unfortunately successfully as some of these universities are in places that aren't your traditional big cities. So uh, I'm worried about the winter and I'm worried about the holiday season and I'm worried about our election cycle. Uh, I think calm uh, should prevail right now. I think the president seems to be just fine and we should behave that way, not only for our people's sake, but also for those that wish us uh, harm overseas to know that we're you know, stronger as Americans together and I'm pretty confident we'll get through it. Tom Bosch, thank you as always for your insight. Thanks, Lindsay. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast free on Apple Podcasts. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Premieres Tuesday, streaming on ABC News Live. ABC News, honored winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, and it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC 
News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Welcome back, everyone. The president's COVID-19 diagnosis comes as his administration and Senate Republicans are pressing ahead to seat Judge Amy Coney Barrett on the U.S. Supreme Court, a move that could reshape our bedrock laws for decades. We saw this scene last weekend, a Rose Garden gathering to announce Judge Barrett's nomination with very little social distancing and very few masks. Now at least four attendees are COVID-19 positive, and Judge Barrett herself reportedly tested positive over the summer, but has subsequently recovered covered to help us unpack just how these COVID cases could impact the Supreme Court confirmation process. We bring in Kate Shaw, constitutional law professor at Cardozo Law School and ABC News contributor. Thanks so much for joining us, Kate. Good to be with you, Lindsay. So some have called for Judge Barrett to quarantine since she was potentially exposed to the virus within the last week. Is that an option if she wants to stay in the running? And for which proceedings, if any, does she need to show up for in person? Well, so she's right now in the process of doing these one-on-one -on -one meetings with various members of the Senate. And in theory, they could decide to forego that part of the process. There's nothing that requires a nominee to have these individual meetings, although it has very much been uh, the tradition for such nominees. So that I think she could forego. The actual confirmation hearing, I think it's very difficult to see suspending. It could be possible to hold that hearing potentially remotely. Of course, it's never been done, but in theory, at least, particularly if you have members of the Judiciary Committee, like Mike Lee, who is on that committee and who has tested positive, unable to participate in person, you could imagine a hearing in which some or potentially all participants are remote rather than present in the same room. So just to really get specific with that, if a number of senators need to isolate or quarantine in the days and weeks ahead, a confirmation process would be able to be done entirely remotely? Well, no. So the hearing itself could be remote. What couldn't happen remotely, at least without a Senate rule change, is the confirmation itself. So you remember back in May, the House of Representatives changed its rules so that its members could vote remotely, anticipating you know just the, this sort of possibility that a number of members could potentially become unable to, uh, to show up in person, uh, as has traditionally been done, in order to cast their vote. So the House changed its rules to allow remote voting, but the Senate hasn't done that. And in fact, Mitch McConnell has steadfastly insisted that there are constitutional problems with allowing members to vote remotely. And so the Senate has not changed its rules. So you could have the, the meetings could happen via Zoom, the hearing itself potentially could, but unless the Senate changes its rules, she cannot be confirmed uh, unless she is able to be confirmed in person by the full Senate. And, and speaking of the Constitution, while the President and First Lady isolate and recover, for now it would seem that the President's re-election campaign is on hold. Would it even be possible to postpone the November November third election. In a word, no. So this, the date of the con the date of the election is set by statute, and so both houses of Congress would have to pass a statute changing the date of the election. The president has no unilateral authority whatsoever in this sphere. And even if you could imagine a world in which the House and the Senate did decide to po postpone the election, which I think is exceedingly unlikely, under the Constitution, the president's term ends on January twentieth. Um, so that's at noon on January twentieth. He is finished being president unless he has been reelected before then. Uh, so even if there was some desire to postpone the election by a couple of weeks, and even if there were some world in which that were politically feasible, the amount of time you know, between November 3rd and January 20th is relatively short. Um, so I, I honestly don't see a world in which it is it, it, uh, any proposal to postpone the election has any real chance of going anywhere. Very helpful. Thank you so much for breaking the Constitution down for us, Kate Shaw. Have a good Thanks, one. Thanks, Lindsay. 
And before we go, we have just learned that yet another senator has tested positive for COVID-19. Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina in a statement saying that he routinely gets tested, including as early as this Saturday, but a test today has come back positive and that he will be isolating at home for the next 10 days. Tillis met with Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett on Tuesday. Back in August, he came under fire for not wearing a mask on the White House South Lawn and issued an apology after that. Earlier today, Senator Mike Lee of Utah also announced that he tested positive for COVID. He also had interactions with Barrett. And finally tonight, our image of the day. President Trump getting off the Marine One helicopter and arriving at Walter Reed Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. To his left, his chief of staff. He has now been hospitalized, the White House tells us, out of an abundance of caution. We certainly wish the president, first lady, and everyone suffering from COVID-19 right, COVID right now a complete recovery. Thanks so much for watching our special edition of Primetime tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a good weekend.